Hey everyone! Before we begin today, we want to thank our newest patron, Anka. Thank you so much and welcome to the team. Also, a reminder that our next live show is happening this weekend. That's Saturday, March 9th at 7.15 p.m. at The Ripped Bodice in Brooklyn, New York. This event is part of Fish Market Theater Company's first ever romance festival, a weekend dedicated to celebrating writing that hasn't historically fit into the cis male-dominated literary canon. Now, there are only a limited number of tickets for our live show, so don't wait until the last minute. It's going to be a really awesome event, and you don't want to miss it. In-person and live stream tickets are available at the link in the show notes, and patrons get 15% off. So if you want a discount, join us at patreon.com slash pod and prejudice. And now, enjoy this week's episode covering the second half of the 1996 Emma starring Kate Beckinsale with our guest, Vanessa Zoltan. This is Becca. This is Molly. We are here to talk about Jane Austen. We are here specifically to talk about Emma! Our final bit on the Kate Beckinsale. Listeners, if you're new here, I, Becca, have read many Jane Austen novels and watched many adaptations in my lifetime. And I, Molly, am doing all of that for the first time through this podcast. If you want to hear Molly read through Pride and Prejudice or Sense and Sensibility for the first time, you can listen to seasons one and two of this podcast respectively, but that is not what we're doing here today. No. Today we are talking about the second part of Kate Beckinsale's 1996 made-for-TV movie, Emma, and we are joined again today by Vanessa Zoltan. Hello. I can't believe you guys had me back. Thank you so much. It's been so long since we recorded that first part. (laughs) Yeah, I, we were all so much younger then. Yeah, we really were. (laughs) So if you want to hear all about Vanessa's work and her relationship to Jane Austen and all of that good stuff, you can hop on over to part one of our coverage of the Kate Beckinsale Emma. But we have too much to cover, so we are going to dive right in to part two. Where we left off, Mr. Elton had just asked Emma very rudely to marry him, and she has said no. Now, Emma goes to see Harriet. And on her way to see Harriet, she sees Mr. Elton leaving in the square, which is something that happens in the book. And I forgot this is the only adaptation that showed that scene. And it also shows you that he's not wealthy, right? Because he's not in his own carriage, which we already know. Mm-hmm. And he it can't even afford to sit in the carriage. He's sitting on top of the carriage and sort of wrapping himself in a blanket. Mm-hmm. So it's another interesting class moment. Yeah. I forgot to mention this, but this adaptation makes hay of the carriages. Like, yes. Every single scene that, like, is an exposition scene is them traveling somewhere in the carriage. Like, it's Harriet and Emma's carriage or the Woodhouse is going to, like, Miss Taylor's wedding in the carriage. Like, there's there's so much that happens in the carriages, which is interesting because our love interest famously doesn't really use his carriage. Except once. Except once. Except once to send it for Jane. So Harriet is heartbroken at the news, but she does not blame Emma. And Emma is like, okay, well, if you forgive me, then I forgive me. (laughs) That's not what she says. She says, if you're not so heartbroken over it. Yes. But yes. She moves on. She forgives herself very quickly. Absolutely. Um, But she does invite Harriet to go with her to Ford's. And on the way, Miss Bates calls down to them to tell them that Jane is there. And I did like the way that Kate Beckinsale delivered her like, oh, Lord, Miss Bates, like through her teeth. Mm -hmm. And when Miss Bates is like, oh, Jane, I'll be so happy to see you. Emma is smiling and she goes, I doubt it. (laughs) As they're going up the stairs into the Bateses, Emma is talking shit about Jane, which like you know that these walls are thin. Yeah, it's exposition, though, because we as the audience don't yet know who Jane is. Right, but do it outside (laughs) is all I'm saying, like, before you enter her home. Jane is played by Olivia Williams, who is Anna Crow in The Sixth Sense. Mm. For anyone who likes horror, I was like, why why does she look so familiar? Such range. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, truly. Um, Though Jane is a little haunted. I can't wait to tell you my Jane theory at the end of this. <gasps> oh, my God. I can't wait. Very excited. It's stolen from my friend, Bethy Allen, but I believe it. Wow. This Miss Bates is perfect. I think she is exactly what I imagined for Miss Bates. Emma is really fast to assume the thing about Mr. Dixon. Like, even before she hears about the... The quote-unquote rescue. Yeah, the rescue. She's like, oh... Mr. and Mrs. Dixon will be very disappointed that you're not coming with them to Ireland. She just like kind of plants this idea immediately. But her vision of the boating party. Again, this just like feels like it's in a totally different movie than the rest of the movie. This like 
daydream of Emma's. Yeah. So then we cut to Jane at Hartfield. They're having their little gathering at Hartfield, and Jane is playing and singing beautifully, and Knightley is watching her with these misty eyes. And I do have to say that if I were Miss Weston, Mrs. Weston, I would also assume that Knightley has a crush on Jane, the way that he talks about her, looks at her, treats her, just saying. Absolutely. It's so brilliant of Austin, right? Because you absolutely read it like that. And then, you know, it's that he feels bad that she isn't going to be able to use these gifts because she is at threat of becoming a governess. And also that he's frustrated with Emma that she has, you know, so many more resources than Jane and she doesn't put the same practice towards it. Mm. So it, it is really well done that you totally understand the misunderstanding and that the payoff of it is so smart. Yeah. Um, and as Emma is watching, Knightley is like, oh, you see in Jane the accomplished young lady that you wish you were mm -hmm. or that you wish that people would see you as. And Emma's like, well, you're making me very ashamed of myself. And she walks away and goes to talk to Jane. A great performance moment. Yes, it is yes. a good performance moment. I'll give her that. She looks ashamed. She does. Yeah. And she tries to get Jane to give her some info on Frank. And this Jane is giving nothing away in such a telling way. Yeah. Like, I think she is one of my favorite Janes. I think it's her and the 2008 slash 2009 Jane. Yeah. They're two very, very different takes on Jane. But I think the two strongest takes on Jane. Mm. Because she, like, you can tell that she has a secret. But she's so good at concealing it that if you didn't know what was coming, you might not. No, yeah. until you see Frank staring at her longingly, and then then you kind of get it. There's also strength to this Jane, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. She's like, she, you get the sense that she's had to have a little grit to make her way in life in this adaptation. I love her. I think she's fantastic in this. Um, yeah. And you can see like that that exterior that she puts on. You can almost get why Emma doesn't like her. Mm -hmm. But only just because it's like t not exactly deserved, but you can see the reason Emma thinks it's like talking to a wall. What's more annoying than someone who won't gossip with you? <laughs> exactly. The worst. Yeah. Whereas I think like other Janes are a little bit more like victims of their circumstances. This Jane seems like she's become like a warrior of her circumstances. Yes. Yes. So we skip right over Harriet first running into Mr. Martin and straight to her going to see the Martins at their house. And Emma's like, you can only stay 15 minutes. She's going to turn her carriage around at the end of the lane and come back and get her. And while she's turning her carriage around, she sees Mr. Martin and she gives him the dirtiest look and he like bows his head. I like that this implies because when she picks up Harriet, she's like, oh, and then Mr. Martin came in at the last minute. I like that this implies that he saw Emma in the carriage by herself and was like, oh, my God, is Harriet at my house? And then turns and like runs in to come and try to see her. <sighs> Emma seems like an asshole here. It's great yes. character development. It really is. he bows really quite deeply to her and she like barely nods her head back. And mm -hmm. it's really, um, yeah, it's gross of her. Yeah. Mm. Um, when she picks up Harriet, Harriet's talking about the measurements on the wall and how, oh, and she thinks I've grown. It really makes her seem so young. <laughs> I know that's my note too. I'm really? like, she's still growing. She right. should not be getting married if she is no. still growing. <laughs> right. Like how old is she supposed to be? I think she's 16, right? Yeah. But I was just like, how was there ever a time in history where we were like, literally, like you are still a child. You are not fully grown and we want you to start procreating. I love Yeah. You can't grow a human inside you if you're still growing. It means that your hips haven't fully formed, right? Like, yeah. this is actually, like, dangerous. This is how... Yeah. Anyway. Which is why the mortality rate in childbirth was so high back then. Yes. I mean, that and also because of just, like, hygiene. Hygiene. For sure. There were so many reasons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I do agree, though. I do think, like, it does highlight her as a child. Yeah. And I think, like, it is interesting how much this adaptation feels comfortable playing in that world because I feel like a lot of more modern adaptations are let's capture the energy of this time period the etiquette of this time period and tug out that stuff that nowadays we know to be really wrong about the Regency era <laughs> Andrew Davies though he is like let's go let's play in this mud but yeah. that <laughs> I mean that line is from the book like it is directly taken so it's interesting yeah 
Emma gets home and we get our intro to Frank Churchill, who is giving, as we have mentioned, Prince Charming vibes. He is very pretty. Caveat, I would also say giving Jasper Cullen vibes. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Uh, you're unfortunately right. You're also, um, Mel pointed out that he's giving David Hasselhoff vibes. Huh. I just look up a side by side. I respectfully disagree, though, because I have indeed seen David Hasselhoff star in Jekyll and Hyde in the live recording of his Broadway turn as Jekyll and Hyde in Jekyll and Hyde the musical. And I cannot personally take the Hoff seriously. Also, I have watched enough Baywatch to to not take the Hoff very serious. But just aesthetically, like the way that they both look is similar. But we don't have to do this right now. Okay. So Frank and Emma are chatting and he is flirting with a capital F with Emma when he calls Mrs. Weston a pretty young woman. And she's like, don't call Mrs. Weston a pretty young woman. And he's like, well, I know who I can call a pretty young woman. Wink, wink. I actually love this Frank, by the way. Oh, <laughs> me too. I think he's phenomenal. Do you guys love, love him or love to hate him? Love to hate him. Okay. Love to hate him. Yes. I think it's Great. just, I think. He's just bringing more of a deviousness to the character yes. than is usual. Yes. And he's kind of sexy with it. I I really hate Frank Churchill in this adaptation. I think that the performance is great. And I think like I think it is so smart, but I the film is making very clear the extent to which he is using Emma. And it's so unfair. And it's just brutal. It's really yeah. brutal. I mean, he is doing to Emma what Emma is doing to Harriet, but like it. You know, they both suck. They're actually a great match for each other. <laughs> I know. It's just really hard to watch in this. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree with everything except that it's hard to watch because I was actually living for his performance. I was like, ooh, you are just like a little slime ball, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I thought you were going to say you're just a little slut. <laughs> yes, that too. Like giving really, like I said, I've been watching a lot of Buffy giving like spike level slut right now. <laughs> we love it. He's reclaiming the name. So he says that he has to go visit the bases, but it's not a big deal. It's nothing important. He's like, oh, maybe the Barnes, the whatever their name is. And they, the next day, are walking outside. And Emma's like, oh, did you go see the bases? And he's like, oh, yes, Jane looked very ill, very ill indeed. And Emma tries to ask him about it. And you can kind of see the panic in his eyes. But then he gives this, like, flirty smile to cover it up. It's just... The subtlety in his performance, he's he's showing all of it. Emma defends Jane, which is something that happens in the book as well that never happens in any of the other adaptations. And she's like, oh, it's, she's just her own style of beauty. And he's like, oh, yeah, maybe maybe you're right about that. I think that, that is a really, really important thing to take from the novel. And I'm glad that this adaptation does that. Me too. I, yeah. I oh, Gosh, I really think you should see the- I, I will. I, but I know. <laughs> pulled up. I promise. I don't know when I'm going to have time, but I, you know I'm going to make the time real soon. Oh, yeah. yeah one yeah. day. One day. <laughs> By one day, I mean like this week. I just, oh, yeah. I'm like looking at my calendar for the week and I'm like, oh, crap. I have plans <laughs> with humans. Uh, oh, my God. Well, let us know how you like I it. will fully report back with Amazing. gratitude. I have no doubt. So they walk by Mr. Elton's house and Frank tells Emma that he heard from Miss Bates that Elton is getting married, which I think is a very interesting way to reveal this to Emma. And she's like, oh, I guess I don't know much at all. And he says that the Eltons will be very happy in their snug little house because how could you want anything more than to share a little home with the person you love, which is it's a nice glimpse into his sentimentality, I guess. They go to Randall's and Frank says that Mr. Dixon always preferred Jane's playing to Miss Campbell's playing. And Emma says, does he prefer her in other ways, too? Mm-hmm. And then <laughs> I loved this part. Frank announces that he has to go to London the next day. And then we cut immediately to Knightley being like to get his hair cut. And then like grumbling under his breath about foppery and nonsense and how trifling it is. And, blah, 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 and how I came here just to meet him. And blah, 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 blah. I have to say two things here. First of all, one is just like embarrassing, which is. I have been reading Austin for over 20 years, and this is the first time I realized that Frank is actually going to London to order the pianoforte. (laughs) And I was like, oh, my God, duh. He is willing to make himself actually look like it. This is like a very lovely quality in Frank. He's like, I now know that Jane is like in this tiny house. I've sort of gotten the measurements. She's not able to practice piano. I know how important this is to her. I'm going to go to London and back in one day to arrange this and look like an asshole who's getting a haircut. But I so I am just embarrassed and I felt like I had to share that. 
And the other thing is that I have a theory that Jane Austen believes that the greatest sign that someone is an asshole is a missed appointment. Mm. Like she just has no tolerance for missed appointments, right? Like Catherine Moreland misses an appointment with Henry Tilney and she's like losing her mind over it. Like there's nothing worse than canceled plans, right? Um, uh, the Bingley's canceled, right? Like this is this is what Jane Austen thinks is truly evil. And so the fact that Knightley was like, I came here just to meet this jerk. You really, if Knightley is standing in uh, representing Austen's morals at all, you know that that is like high treason. Mm. And you can tell because yes. he is pissed and he's like, I have stuff to do. I have to go. And he I, I like actually have to take care of tenants and I came here to meet a guy and he's not here because he had to go to get a haircut. Yeah. Like nightly same. I would be yeah. outraged. Same. Yeah. That's like if you live in New York and you take the train somewhere and oh. then your person texts you and is like, I'm actually not coming. You're like, I just took the train to meet you and I could have been at my house. No, yeah. it's awful. It's awful. If I leave my apartment and go into Manhattan and someone has decided halfway through my train ride that actually they're going to be late or not there at all, I will be furious. Yeah. yeah. To be clear, Austin is not wrong on this. That is oh, a yes. sign of a weak character. Now, I will say that in reading the book, the pianoforte timing is not so obvious. Thank you. Okay. And yeah. It took me a while to it until I saw a movie adaptation where I was like, he was gone. I mean, I might have realized at the end after much discussion, like he was gone right before the pianoforte arrived. But this one, it's like he goes to get his hair cut. The pianoforte arrives. Yeah. And you're like, oh, OK. But just to be clear, Molly, not me. Not me. Didn't no. notice. No, that's okay. It's truly, it took me some time to get that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I like the pianoforte arriving and being like hoisted up by the straps in through the window because it just shows how little space they have and like how narrow their hallway is. And, and how committed he was to paying extra for like proper delivery, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, again, had not recalled that I saw this movie almost until the moment that this moment happened because- as a kid who loved watching Austin adaptations as a child, like this right here was so formative that I was like, oh my God, they have to put the piano through the window. And now I was watching it and I was like, I've seen this. <laughs> it's quite similar to the scene in, this is such a side tangent and we don't have time for it, but I just have to say that in While You Were Sleeping, she is trying to get her Christmas tree up and through the window by the same method because mm -hmm. she lives by herself and she's like how am I going to do this and she drops it and it crashes through her landlord's window and uh that's it's a very similar this scene. is I mean if you have a narrow um stairway right like this is like very typical I yeah. lived in I lived in a dorm until I was 37 years old and it, it was a problem getting a couch up the stairwell and none of the windows opened because you can't trust college students with windows and yeah. so right like it it, it's really hard. Yeah, I know Becca has a story about a couch, which again, we should probably keep going, but pivot. Her couch is never going to leave that apartment. Unless I cut it in half. Yeah, <laughs> you're going to have to saw it in half. So we get this dinner party at Randall's and Emma and Knightley have their interaction outside about, oh, you came in your carriage. Hmm. And it's kind of a nice interaction. He smiles at her for once. <laughs> and inside, Emma tells Frank about the pianoforte. And she says she thinks it came from Mr. Dixon as an offering of love. And this was one of my favorite quotes. He says, an offering of love. I think you're right. It was or something like that. That was like a sexy little moment. It's one of those like Emma's not picking up on it. The audience is. But the mm -hmm. look in his eyes when he's like, yeah, I think that was an offering of love. I was like, <gasps> yeah, Frank. and we're going to flash back to that later. Mm -hmm. After dinner, Emma is playing the piano and Frank jumps in to do the most mediocre duet in history but it's better that he's not a great singer right because he's just and so she isn't. flipping fit. yeah yeah but she, she he's just so full of himself yeah and I think that it's clear that he is trying to set this up of him doing like he's first trying to flirt with Emma right but then he's also trying to set himself up to be able to do a duet with Jane in a little bit as well sneaky sneaky then Knightley asks Jane to play. And as she's playing, Frank is looking sad. And Emma's like, what's wrong? And he just says that Jane's hair looks odd. And he wants to go ask her if it's an Irish fashion. And Emma's like, no, 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 don't do it. And he does. But he gets up and instead of asking her, he does a duet with her. Then Mrs. Weston comes up to Emma 
to tell her that Mr. Knightley sent his carriage for the Bateses specifically, and he thinks that he and Jane are a match. And Emma is like, no, Knightley doesn't care for Jane like that. But as she's telling her that, Knightley is like telling Frank to stop making Jane sing. She'll sing herself for us. She deserves a rest, blah, 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 blah. And then Frank asks Emma to dance. And I, I am curious because this scene in a lot of other adaptations is a bigger party. It's like more of a dance party. Yeah. Um, do they have dancing at like small dinner parties like this often? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, it just to make another Austin, use Austin as an example. This is a big deal in persuasion because Anne is an excellent piano player, which mm. means she's always playing the piano and never gets to dance. Oh, and so okay. you had someone in the family who was a good piano player. I mean, like, you know, there wasn't Spotify. These were your choices. That's very true. Leading to my favorite moment in the entire film. <laughs> oh, God. Emma has another vision. It's a wedding between Knightley and Jane. And there's this eerie off kilter music playing and then a spotlight on Emma in the aisle holding little Henry by the hand and she just yells what about little Henry which there is no context to this in the movie it is infuriating in the novel you understand this is a preoccupation of Emma's that if Mr. Knightley marries then her nephew who thought he was going to inherit isn't going to inherit no context so dumb it's perfect there's no notes because if you're not someone who's read the book you're just watching this and there's a child and a haunted child and goes little henry and just i hated it i hated it so much i think i thought exact it was exactly as good storytelling as you did but no i I know i love that you have a better attitude about life (laughs) i'm just like so grumpy i'm like how dare you it's hilarious though and it's foreshadowing for a future one that i like even more another (laughs) Um, vision if you will that we'll get to then Emma and Harriet go to visit Jane and Frank is already there and when they enter Jane and Frank have been sitting on the couch together and they fly apart yes that, nobody notices nobody I know. says anything this is when the movie to me goes over the top with hinting about Frank and Jane it's less than hinting it's just happening yeah they're like making out they are yeah. making out when we yeah. come in and yeah of, of course mrs bates is just in the corner asleep probably i mean yeah. she's awake but she's not noticing these things or sh- is she or is she but she's just not telling she's not anyone. saying anything yeah yeah <laughs> so he says he's been trying to wedge paper under the piano forte to stop it from wobbling and he says jane can you test it out now and as she's playing he mentions that the tune was danced at weymouth and she's like Christ. And she continues to play and he comments that it's an Irish tune and how like, oh, whoever sent the music must have been it's very thoughtful of them trying to imply that it was Mr. Dixon. But he sent that music to throw off the sense that it could be from him. And then right in front of Jane, he asks Emma for the first two dances of the ball. And Jane takes this in and kind of just like looks down and looks sad and continues to play. Hello, it's Molly from the future hopping in to tell you about a new season of one of my absolute favorite podcasts. Hot and Bothered, hosted by returning Pod and Prejudice guest Vanessa Zoltan, is a podcast that treats romance as sacred. You've probably all already heard of this podcast because in their fourth season, they covered Pride and Prejudice. And now Hot and Bothered is back with a season that is all about romantic films. The first 10 episodes of this new season follow Vanessa as she learns how to critically watch movies by looking closely at the classic 2003 rom-com How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. After 10 episodes, Vanessa will be joined by her co-host Hannah McGregor, a media studies scholar, author, and podcaster, and together they'll look at romantic films from Casablanca to Love and Basketball to When Harry Met Sally. The show is already so fun after just listening to one episode, and I cannot wait to listen to the rest of the season. So subscribe to Hot and Bothered wherever you get your podcasts to jump into this new season that's all about romantic films or to enjoy their previous seasons about Pride and Prejudice, Jane Eyre, and a personal favorite, Twilight. Again, that's Hot and Bothered, and it can be found wherever you get your podcasts. Also, this August, Vanessa is leading a pilgrimage to Bath for a five-day trip dedicated to Northanger Abbey. Now, I don't know anything about Northanger Abbey, but even I want to go on this trip. Together, you and 20 other Austinites are delving into the story of Catherine Moreland while immersed in a gorgeous city that features heavily in Austin's life and writing, as you know. So if you enjoy contemplative hikes, immersion in a new city, time away from your regular life, and the chance to talk about Austin with fans from all over the world, which I know all of you do, then this trip is for you. So check out Common Ground Pilgrimages at readingandwalkingwith.com. 
To claim your spot on the Northanger Abbey trip, head to readingandwalkingwith.com slash northanger-abbey-2024. And now back to this episode. Then Mr. Elton returns with Mrs. Elton, who is played by Louisa from the 1995 Pride and Prejudice. I want to take a minute, and I don't think that I'll have much to say about her throughout, except to comment on her accent. I mean, she's phenomenal. But what is her accent? It's like a combination British, Irish, like Southern American. It. I am just going to believe that it's accurate to some part of England. It's like, got to be. Accents are like so much. Like you can tell when someone is from like East London versus West London, apparently. Yeah. So like it has to be real. I'm sure it is. And I think that part of it is that it's whatever the accent is, she's trying to posh it up. Yes. Which is why there are moments where she slips into something different. Yeah. Then so it's it's a combination of things, which I think is a brilliant. I do too. We just we're too American to understand yes. how smart this mm-hmm. is. Yeah. Absolutely. We can just assume it's smart. Yes. And Elton and Mrs. Elton are such a good match in this. Like they genuinely work together uh very well which I I like like she doesn't seem so annoyed at him as she does in other adaptations like they both both suck and they work together because of it yeah I really just like Mr. Elton's performance in this because he's really funny but he also just feels very real as annoying like yes if that makes sense and it is one of the only adaptations where I think Elton is almost as, if not as annoying as Augusta herself. So it's just like interesting that like that's what makes them work is that he is also as shitty and not as put upon in this. I think that Anya Taylor-Joy does a similar job with Elton. Mm -hmm. The problem with the Gwyneth Paltrow one, if I remember correctly, is that Alan Cumming is playing Elton and he's, he's never annoying. He's sometimes scary, but he is never annoying. Who has ever been annoyed by Alan Cumming? Right. Certainly not me. No. No. So Emma and Mrs. Weston are talking about Mrs. Elton and how Jane doesn't deserve all of her attention. And Knightley comes over saying, well, she receives attentions from Mrs. Elton that she doesn't receive from anyone else, Emma. And wink, uh, wink, 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 cough, cough. Note his little bow on his hat. It's (laughs) it's very cute. I I missed the bow. I, I, oh, he's just he's got a bow on his hat. I, it's adorable. I just I'm going to need to go back and see it. I I was having existential crises every time he was on the screen because I really I truly don't know what they were doing, but I I'm glad he had a bow. Yes, he had a bow. Emma tries to imply that he might like Jane, like she tries to get it out of him, and he doesn't really catch on. He's like, "Well, anybody may know how highly I think of her." Then Frank comes to say goodbye because he has to go back to Mrs. Churchill. And Mr. Woodhouse is sleeping, so they have to whisper the whole scene, um, which is funny if you miss that Mr. Woodhouse is sleeping, like some of our patrons did, because they would, like, halfway through the scene, they were like, why are they whispering? And (laughs) sitting so close to each other. Yes. Now, I cannot blame Emma for thinking that he is going to tell her that he loves her, because he is looking at her with so much longing. Yes. And... There's no lead up to maybe you understand that I like Jane. It all seems like maybe you understand that I like you. Oh, he's an asshole. The worst. Absolutely. Which is why I can't wait to tell you my friend Betsy's theory. I want to hear it so bad. But no, I want to I want to make sure that your podcast, I never have a twist to offer. So let me use this to drag everyone along with us. So we will we will save the twist. But for now, speaking of twists, I really like what they did with Emma's hair in this scene. And mm. I would want to do it to my own hair. What was what was happening with her? Hair? It was like a cute little like ribbon headband situation where she was like around the house and her hair was up. And I was like, oh, that's cute today. But I love it on her. It Like, it's so stunning. She looks so beautiful in this scene, which adds to it. They really like choose like a beautiful man to play Frank a beautiful woman to play Emma and set them up in this perfect lighting and have them whispering to each other to really like drive home this point of like this is like the the match that everyone's talking about yes um, it it's really beautifully done I do have to say and we'll we'll get to this later I like the way they do this scene I agree that Frank makes it seem very much like he's going to propose to Emma in this he's moment. He's the worst. But also, I would say, and we'll get to this, 
the the gap between Frank leaving and Frank coming back is so small. It's so short. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they are like, we cannot have our ball. It's so sad. Then Emma and Harriet walk through the field and Emma tells Harriet that she isn't in love with Frank. Oh, no. In my notes, I wrote that she isn't in love with Jane. <laughs> She is. Aww. She is. Uh, she is. Yes. Emma tells Harriet that she isn't in love with Frank. And then we cut to dinner with the Eltons and the Bateses. And Jane is saying like, oh, I don't want you to get me a job, Mrs. Elton. And then Mr. Weston arrives and says that the Churchills have gotten a house in Richmond and Frank is coming back and you can have your ball after all. So it was like all within the span of two minutes. Yep. Then we cut straight to the ball and we see Emma and Frank dancing and nightly watching them. And... He is like kind of looking angsty about it, but then he smiles because Jane and Miss Bates arrive. And then Mrs. Elton comes up to Mr. Weston and she's like, oh, Frank gets my approval. And I just have to say uh, the way that she says Mr. Weston, again, this is a comment on her accent, says Mr. Weston feels like she is the unsinkable Molly Brown on the Titanic. <laughs> like she's got like a transatlantic accent. I, I, I don't even know how to describe it, but. It's it so is good. such a weird accent. It's it is so weird. so weird. British listeners, can you inform us? Like, can you DM yes. us on Instagram and just give us the lowdown on what's going on with Mrs. Elton's accent in this? Because, f- Vanessa, for your benefit, I always picture Mrs. Elton in, like, a real valley girl kind of accent. Like, Amber from Clueless is my, like, ultimate Mrs. To be clear, Elton. that's a West L.A. accent, not a valley girl accent. I'm Uh-oh. sorry, I am from Van Nuys. Sorry. If there is... An accent that I know. But yes, please go. <laughs> I forgive you. It's very much like that, like, like vocal fry. All the words go up at the end. And like the yeah. mm, mean girl sort of like, mm. totally. But and that's, I think, what Amber brings to Clueless as yes. a Mrs. Elton of that adaptation. Really quick tangent. And I will be brief on this. A lot of people have been messaging us and saying, like, actually, Amber is a combo Jane Fairfax and Mrs. Elton. I don't see it, frankly. I, I know some people might think so, but I, I see her as a pure Miss Elton. Because, yeah. Like, there's no there's sense no in which Emma's... There's no Jane Fairfax in yeah. Clueless. Yeah. The, the, the gay agenda is The Jane gay Fairfax. agenda is Jane Fairfax. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I have not rewatched Clueless in too many years, so I need to. We we covered Clueless, and we talked about Miss Amber being the Mrs. Elton equivalent. She's like Emma's rival. They are frenemies to each other, and then she ends up with Elton in the end. Yeah. Um. But a lot of people basically were like, no, she's also Jane, like the the adversary to Emma. And I was like, yeah, but that's misunderstanding Jane in the book, in my personal opinion, because Jane is like... Yeah, no, they're not adversaries. Yeah, Emma has like a beef with her because she's jealous of her. Emma's not... Shares not jealous of Amber. No. No, and Emma genuinely feels for Jane at yeah. like at two thirds of the way through, and yeah, Sharon Amber never have that moment. Exactly. So, I I hear people say the Jane Fairfax point as to Amber and Clueless. I respectfully disagree, and we can move on. <laughs> yes. So two key things happen at this dance. Mister Elton snubs Harriet, and Knightley comes to save her, and. Emma comes up to Knightley and says that was well done and they have their little conversation and then he says who will you dance with and she says with you if you'll ask me and I do have to say that I think that they did this part very well her with you if you'll ask me is so casually thrown out there and his reaction when she says we're not so much brother and sister that it would be inappropriate and he's like brother and sister no not at all father daughter of course Uh -uh. brother (laughs) and sister (laughs) yeah (laughs) however This dance to me has been so crucial and I wish you guys could have seen the way this conversation went down in our discord community because it was like, oh my gosh, I hope we get to see the dance. The dance better redeem this movie because so far there's been no chemistry and blah, 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 blah. And then it cuts immediately away from the dance and we don't get to see the dance. And everyone was like, guess not. (laughs) It was so funny, but it's fine because this movie isn't attempting to show the steamy dance touching hands you know this is just not the vibe it's about the yearning but not so much here yeah well it's about the yearning but the unseen yearning so it's fine then we get Harriet and her friend walking through the field and we catch a snippet of their conversation where she's like talking about nightly coming to rescue her so we start to see like oh she thought that, that was more than it was it is such a swoon moment though it is it is I mean he 
he walks past Mr. Elton and Elton's like Mr. Knightley and he says excuse me yeah he doesn't even acknowledge him and then he asks Harriet to dance and it's a very sweet dance and it shows that he takes little slights seriously like this is a good man who's like I will help you harvest your food I will move in with you Mm. because I love you and also not asking someone to dance is inappropriate like he's just good to his bones God bless you Mr. Knightley ugh dreamboat behavior yeah and I also want to quickly note Mrs. Elton in that moment noticing the slight to her husband and saying look how generous of Knightley to take pity on Harry and Miss Smith and and dance with her in this moment how how good of heart he is to sort of like bolster up the fact that her husband didn't just like completely snub her Mm -hmm. then we get this very dramatic attack scene and Harriet's friend ditches her as happens in the book and Frank comes and rescues her and when he brings her to Hartfield, she finally just seems rattled and she's crying, but she's not moaning dramatically, which has been something that's really gotten me in every other adaptation. Yes, I know. She's really scared. Yeah. Samantha Morton, good job. This was the one moment where I was mm. like, okay, we are kind of seeing something about Harriet. This is traumatic. It's it, yeah, completely classist and racist, but it's traumatic. Yes. I mean, her friend ditched her while they were being mugged. Like, I would be pissed and I would be scared as well. But it is it's never been a good look for Emma, the story. So, yeah, we, we've had conversations about this moment with the Romani people and obviously the issues that it brings up. And then we had we've had a minor debate on the podcast as to Austin's intent with the scene. One of the things we talk about is that, like, it's kind of like sensationalized through uh, Highbury that this happened because it's not actually that big a deal and everyone makes a big stink about it because nothing ever happens there. And this movie takes it more at face value and makes the potential of giving money to Romani children very terrifying and like dramatic. And I don't know how I feel about that choice. I know I don't like that choice. I don't like this scene and I've been clear that it continues to be a weird scene in the book and in every adaptation. But There's more tongue-in-cheek to that scene in a lot of these other adaptations, and this scene plays it very straight. It also makes clear that it's children, that it's, like, not, right? Like, it's hungry children, which, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be better if they didn't show the mom being, like, go get them. Go. Totally. That shot of the mom being, like, go. Two moms. Yeah. Two moms. So progressive. Yeah. (laughs) It's true. Yeah, it's it's not great. This this scene irked me for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Yes. But the aftermath is done better than others. Yeah. Um, and then Emma has a very dramatic vision of Harriet and Frank riding off into the sunset. Then we get a voiceover. This is weird. A voiceover. Yep. See, again, totally new form for the film. Out of nowhere. 90 minutes in. New form. Mr. Knightley invites you to taste his strawberries, wink, wink, which are ripening fast, wink, wink. And <laughs> we go to them at... Donwell and Mrs. Elton saying like oh you should have left everything to me and him saying well I'm only gonna ever leave anything to Mrs. Knightley and then Mrs. Elton pulls this face that I can't even describe but it's like well (laughs) she like sticks out her tongue I can't even it's so funny it's so funny I'll put a screenshot on her Instagram and then they're picking the strawberries and they focus Andrew Davies once again on the servants pulling the cushions in front of each strawberry they want to pick. And I've never seen this so well done in any other Austin adaptation. And they make a lot of it with Mrs. Elton, right? Where Mrs. Elton is like, oh, I love to play provincial. And I love, like, right, like, to glorify this, like, ancient sense of what poverty would be. And yet she, like, snaps at a servant to move her knee cushion. It's so well done. And one of my favorite line moments is in this when she says, oh, I fancy myself a kind of shepherdess. And then Miss Bates goes, oh, do you like sheep then, Mrs. Elton? And Mrs. Elton just like, no, like looks at her like, are you fucking kidding me? (laughs) Uh, Like she doesn't even know what the word shepherdess means. It's very Marie Antoinette, right? Who was like a fake shepherdess. It's Mm. really I really loved this edition. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Mrs. Weston is worrying about Frank not being there yet. And Mrs. Elton is telling Jane that she's found her a job. 
and they're like right on the other side of this archway and then Jane is like I have to go get some air and she goes into the archway but Mrs. Elton's still like right there like this all happens in front of everyone but kind of off to the side Emma comes over to the archway and asks Jane if she's okay and Jane says she needs to go and if Emma could just tell everyone that she had to go home to check on her grandmother the comfort of being sometimes alone is what she says yep I think it's well done. It's different than a lot of other adaptations, and I appreciated it. Yeah, and it's the most faithful to the novel, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the thing that was missing to me is a knowing look from Emma being like, oh, yes, I would also find it insufferable to live with Miss Bates, which Mm -hmm. is the – like, that's not what's going on, but that's another misunderstanding that's happening here. Mm -hmm. But, no, I I really love this. Poor Jane. Yeah. Yeah. I wish that that we had the line. Um, we all know what it is like to sometimes be weary of spirits and I must confess mine are fatigued or something like that. Mine are exhausted. Exhausted. Yeah. That's it's one of my favorite scenes. <laughs> yeah. I think we get the spirit of it, which I like. Yes, I do. This movie also in a lot of scenes pushes everything together, like to be closer together physically, like in proximity. I think that this is something that we get in some miniseries and also, oddly enough, in the 2005 Pride and Prejudice, like things being in close proximity because Jane walks away and in the entryway to this little area where everyone's hanging out, she bumps into Frank and they have a silent interaction where he must say something to her and she leans in as if she's like spitting some words out towards him and then walks away in a huff and I think that it's so lovely and interesting to see that happen right there yeah while everyone else is just oblivious to it yep Emma comes in to see her dad and the scene is it's like such a, a short little moment but it is so freaking cute because she comes in and he's sitting by the fire with all of his little trinkets and he's like oh I'm well here by the fire but I hope you're being careful because this can be a, a drafty house oh I love that. The And like that is one of the ways that we always know that Emma is good, right? Yes. Is that she's so nice to her dad. She will yeah. always look out for him. We haven't talked about it much in this adaptation, but we always we always give shine to Mr. Woodhouse as one of our favorite characters. But he's he's in this one, like they take it to the extreme of him being sort of old and doddering and and anxious. Like if you compare it to some of the other um, Mr. Woodhouses out there, he's really like she needs to take care of him and someone needs to take care of him at all times. And he's yeah. kind of, he he looks like a, her grandpa for most of the movie. Yeah, he does. I think he's one of my favorite Mr. Woodhouse. I've loved every Mr. Woodhouse in their own way, but he, there's something about him that is so endearing. It's just Mr. Woodhouse is supposed to be comic relief as far as I'm concerned. And he's not funny in this one. I agree. He's, Scared about transition, but he's not a hypochondriac in the same way. That's so mm. funny. I don't know. I really love the Onion Taylor Joy. Um, Bill, Bill Nye. Nye. I enjoy Mr. Woodhouse's comic relief. I respect the choice to have him be sort of more pathetic than funny. Yeah. Well, I think that it's two very different takes on him. And I think that to me, this way is a little bit more what you're getting in the book. Um, and Bill Nye being so sprightly is uh just he is hilarious um so funny so good and and bill nye you can do no wrong in my mind like exactly. he's perfect but i think that this mr woodhouse he breaks my heart in a way that i think is necessary because and, and i think that if they had made a bigger deal about emma being like oh wait i can't move out i have to stay with my dad that would have hit home a little bit more because they didn't do that like it just was already decided but you can really see why she can't move out. Yeah. Now, Frank arrives in a huff. Now, we already know he's already been here, but he finds Emma and he is complaining like, oh, the party's already breaking up and it's hot and I'm grumpy and why did I come all this way? And he is like, you know what? I'm being a bear. If I come to Box Hill, I'll I'll promise to be in a better temper. And then he leaves. So this is a very quick interaction, but he is very grumpy. Never gets a snacky snack, though. He never gets a snacky snack. He just goes home. And there's so many strawberries. So many strawberries. Like, endless strawberries. How did they get that many strawberries out of that tiny patch? But we won't get into the details. Then we get Box Hill. And this is another scene in which the servants are really highlighted. Because we see... 
everybody like hiking with their little parasols and then the servants carrying all of this stuff and the chairs fall off and they're like, oh my God, we have to put the chairs back on the cart. And it's just like, oh, they needed to really work their servants to get all of their crap up to the top of this hill. And it shows first Mrs. Elton uh, struggling getting up the hill with nothing but a parasol and the help of Mr. Elton. And then it shows the servants carrying everything up. And I just love this point. I One of my pet peeves in the history of the world is the way that we talk about people who've climbed Mount Everest. And what we mean by that is white people who have climbed Mount Everest because there are Sherpas who are doing this and carrying all the shit. Yep. And so I love that this movie addresses the Mount Everest problem. Yes. Yes. That is such a good point. I like this little moment where they're at the bottom of the hill and Mrs. Elton goes, oh, that's Box Hill. Well, I'm very glad to see it. I kind of like to imagine that she didn't realize they'd be walking. That they were going to hike. Totally. And so she's like, what the fuck? We have to <laughs> climb up it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We get the Perry carriage comment from Frank where he's like, oh, what happened to Mr. Perry getting a carriage? And Jane is like, <sighs> shoot some daggers, man. She's like, can you shut up? And he's like, oh, right. That must have been a dream, <laughs> which, you know, we've seen some dreams in this movie, so it could have been, I guess. <laughs> yeah. People in this universe just have really weird out of context dreams about other people in Highbury. That's just what happens. Yeah. So this is the first time I have ever understood the alphabet game that they play, because <laughs> in the book and in every other adaptation, instead of handing a handful of letters and having them mix them up, the like, it's impossible to do so in a book because you have to spell out what letters they are. But in the book, it's Blunred and Dixnow. And it's like, those are obviously Blunder and Dixon because you didn't mix up the letters enough. But when you're getting handed a pile of letters, I understand why, how you could not understand what the word is. So I think that this is the first time I've ever understood the alphabet game. And I want to thank this movie for giving me that. Jane obviously gets upset at the Dixon. And Blunder. And right? Blunder. She's like, you can't apologize to me by handing me an acronym, right? Like, right. I understand. I, yeah. No, she's just so annoyed with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's like, can you just stop trying to talk to me in front of people? Like, just don't right. do it. Just behave. And Knightley notices this and he's like, hey, what's going on? Why are you being this way? And also, don't do you understand the extent of the relationship between Frank and Jane? And Emma's like, N -n -n no, 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 there's nothing there. Don't worry. Now, everyone is picnicking in pairs, which makes this make so much more sense <laughs> than all everyone sitting in a circle and Frank and Emma just like flirting loudly in front of everyone because like everyone's coupled off. So, of course, they're chatting together. Yep. So I like how this is laid out. But then we get, of course, the three very dull indeed comments and Emma saying, well, you'd be limited to just three, so you might have a problem. And Miss Bates immediately starts crying. I, it's my favorite thing about Emma that the big tense moment is that Emma says something rude. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's what the whole plot hinges on. Yep. Is mm -hmm. Emma says something rude. And I flipping love it because that is devastating. Those are the things that, like, at 41, I remember from 30 years ago. And like wake me in the middle of the night and make me shudder, even when I, if I was the rude one or if I was the person publicly insulted. Yeah. And so I just I'm like, Austin gets it. Yeah, she gets it. And what she gets the most is that it's OK when someone says something about themselves jokingly. But if you say it back and you mean it, then you need to sit down. Yeah. And she also knows that I was kidding is the last resort of assholes. Right. Because like Emma being like, I, it was a joke. It's like fuck you. It wasn't a joke. You just suck. Yeah. I also think there's something to this because like the whole book is built around the banter of Knightley and Emma like lovingly insulting each other back and forth in like gentle, fun kind of ways. And then you have the one to Miss Bates and the what makes it different and what makes it strong and real is like how badly Miss Bates needs Emma to like her, the power imbalance. She doesn't want to be a charity case. Exactly. And there's like, there's this great line that I, I really liked the Box Hill fight between Knightley and Emma in this one. I think it's quite well done. It's not badly done indeed. Um, and when he says to her, like, when you were born, it was an honor for you to be noticed by Miss Bates. Now it's the opposite. Now she is poor. She has fallen to a less comfortable station. 
that it just it's a gut punch that like yeah you can't punch down you exactly. it can only right like you are punching down now exactly I like how his uh kind of scolding of Emma is also done kind of in hushed tones yeah he's not publicly embarrassing her right he's like you did wrong and she it hits home she cries she's like but it's not over dramatic crying it's like she turns around and there's tears on her face and she's like oh my god there's tears on my face in another Emma flaw I'm so sorry it's just that she never apologizes to Miss Bates right she just tries to make it up but she never apologizes and that's especially clear in this one because yeah the visit that she makes right after this is so fast Right. And all we hear is Miss Bates talking, but we don't hear Emma say anything in return. And that's when we find out that Jane has taken a job and she's leaving forever. And Miss Bates seems so sad. And this is something that adaptations tend to just skip the yes. governess of it all. Mm. Yeah. Now, we did skip over one thing that I'm going to note, which is the comment that Frank makes about people get making a match after a short acquaintance and regretting it forever and Jane saying well only a weak character would allow themselves to be trapped forever I've never understood why he says it why I mean I know he's mad at Jane for leaving the day before but why would he be so mean in such a way that like she is the only one who's going to know he's talking about her and is just so hurtful she's told him that she's considering the governance job like oh. he's really mad right He's like, you're blowing it all up. And then maybe this is when I tell you my theory. Yes. Tell yes, us the theory. Yes. Because fine. he has just told her that he's planning on murdering his aunt. <laughs> and he's like, I figured out the solution, lady. And she's like, no. She's like, don't become a murderer for me. Well, she's like, I don't want to be complicit. So don't flip and do it. I'm going to take a governess job. And he's like, no, but I just figured it out. So so is your friend's theory that he does murder his that aunt? That he murders his aunt <sighs> and that Jane knows. And because she says no to him and therefore isn't truly complicit in the murder, she can sort of forgive him and be happy at the end. But that the mistake he makes is in telling Jane he's going to murder his aunt. I am obsessed. And I think that there is a spinoff movie book something that needs to happen about that to be clear my friend Betsy is like this is not a fan theory this is canon like she is just like this is in the fucking book just pay attention you know you could read that because we spend a lot of the book talking about Frank's relationship how bogged down he is by his aunt and a lot of the book where people openly are like she's not actually sick she's not actually sick she's a hypochondriac she's mm -hmm. a and he's like do you know what she wants to be sick fine I'll kill her and like that he like makes it home in time for her to die with him even though he's been away so much like it absolutely Betsy Allen attorney at law in Detroit Michigan everybody she's a genius genius wow I'm obsessed. One last thing I will say about the Frank and Jane thing, and then you can move on, Molly, I promise, is that what this movie does correct about the Frank and Jane plot is that it is a simmering rage onto the surface the whole time. They are tense because they are in tension the entire time. So when he says that, it's after months and months of fighting and being hurt by each other. And like the most sympathetic tank on Frank is that he is sick and tired of having to try to pretend he's not in love with Jane all the time and he just wants to deal with it. He also just wants to have sex. Exactly. And plot murder. And, and plot murder. And well, he doesn't want to plot murder, but that's where we are. Yeah. He's right, gonna you're take right. a governess job and yeah. he's gotta do what he's gotta do. He's gotta do something and fast. And we have seen that he's capable of being sociopathic when necessary. True. So um after the Bateses, Emma comes home and nightly is leaving to go to John and Isabella's and when he hears that she's been to the Bateses he takes her hand and he looks at it but it's not it's not quite a near kiss but it's maybe as close as we're gonna get yeah Harriet says she's never gonna marry because there's someone she likes and she can never have him and Emma's like well stranger things have and then she cuts herself off and she's like you know what never mind I'm not gonna interfere which I like because in a lot of adaptations, she does meddle. She's like, I'm not going to interfere, but stranger things have happened in this. She's like, you know what? I'm starting over. Then Miss Bates pokes her head out to say that Jane hasn't left her room for three days. And we cut straight to Jane walking through the field and sobbing. And Robert Martin sees her and they both are just like heartbroken. And it's ugh. earnestly. That is actually probably my favorite scene in this adaptation that's added. I love giving these two people who are like put upon by their circumstances and separated from the people they love this moment of connection. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Now, I like how they did this next scene. A messenger comes in the night, and we have a voiceover of Frank saying, Dear Father, Mrs. Churchill has died. My future is uncertain. She has fallen backwards onto a knife. Oh, no. Yeah, or she has, you know, she drank some mysterious liquid, and who mm-hmm. knows? Yeah. Then Emma and Harriet are getting their hair done together and wondering how much money Frank Churchill was left and also who will he marry now he has his choice. And they both seem to be wondering, will he marry the other person, which I think is very cute. Yeah. Then we get Emma reading outside and Mr. Weston comes by and he's like, oh, my God, Mrs. Weston needs to talk to you. It's an emergency. And Emma's like, oh, my God, what's going on? So they go and Mrs. Weston tells her that Frank is engaged to Jane and he sent the pianoforte. And we get flashbacks to all the moments between Frank and Jane. And Mrs. West is like, he had to conceal it because he feared his aunt's disapproval. And Emma's like, or that she would disinherit him, which is a good point. Then Emma is like, oh, my God, what am I going to tell Harriet? And then we cut to Harriet being like, what are you going to tell me? Why do you care? What I like, I don't care about him. And Emma's like, uh oh. And when Harriet realizes that Emma has misunderstood her, she reveals that she meant Mr. Knightley, which I like because in a lot of adaptations, Emma's like, wait a minute, do you mean Mr. Knightley? Which is like, of course she meant Mr. Knightley, but she needs to be the one to tell you that. Emma says, if I had known you meant Mr. Knightley, I would never in a million years have encouraged you, which is so rude. (laughs) And Harriet's like, well, I never would have thought of him if you hadn't encouraged me. And then we cut to Emma storming away and being like, oh, I wish I had never met her. which is so harsh. It's always harsh. It's way harsh. Way harsh, Ty. We get flashbacks to a bunch of moments between Harriet and Knightley, and then this is my favorite part. The music goes into a minor key, and it's (laughs) Knightley and Harriet's wedding, and as he's putting the ring on her finger, Harriet looks over with this cursed smile, like her eyes look up, and she's like in a horror movie, and Emma's standing in the aisle by herself, and she goes, no! I just, a moment for that. (laughs) chef's kiss it's cinema i what what can we say (laughs) then mr woodhouse wakes up and asks emma if she said anything so that implies that she has yelled no out loud and we hear knightley's voice saying you and i shall never be enemies never be enemies never be enemies again introducing a totally new (laughs) can see we're at the last moment of the film are we still introducing new motif yeah totally and emma is looking out at the rain and she's crying and she goes i love him i have always loved him and mr woodhouse by the way is still sitting there um yeah (laughs) (laughs) then emma is sitting by the fountain and nightly comes and she like starts looking around for somewhere to hide but there's nowhere to hide so she pulls it together and She's like, oh, you must have had a wet ride, (laughs) which I thought was just a hilarious thing to say to someone. (laughs) That is the one thing I remember from the Gwyneth adaptation that I love is that when Knightley says to her, like, I rode all night. And then he goes, I rode through the rain as if like that makes him brave. And I just I love I love that moment. And in this one, she's just like, well, you must have had a wet ride. Wet ride. Yeah. (laughs) yeah. It It does something very differently here. And they say there's no sex in Austin. Exactly. (laughs) So true. So he's trying to comfort her so intensely. And Emma's like, no, 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 I'm fine. And then he starts yelling about how Frank gets everything he wants. And Emma's like, well, you seem like you're envious of him. And he's like, I am envious of him, but she won't ask him. And she stops him from talking. And then immediately without any shift happening, she says, well, listen, you can tell me as a friend. His proposal speech is good. I will give him that up until a point, it is very good. And then? And then (laughs) as soon as he, so he says, if I loved you less, I might be able to talk about it more, but you know what I am, blah, 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 blah. And she's like, I do return your feelings. And he says, then you consent. Now I'm glad we've gotten consent because we're all adults that can consent. You consent. She says, yes, I do. And he says, I held you in my arms when you were three weeks old. Yep. And Why? that, I think, because Andrew Davies is like, we are not shying away from this. I wish he would. <laughs> the weird thing is, is that it's not even the last time he's going to say something creepy to her. I know. Here is the thing. It's only creepy because of the age difference. Because, like, I was three and a half and held my baby brother in my arms, right? Like, you can be a child who holds a child. And yes. so if he was three when he did this, I like, what he's trying to say is, like, I've known you your whole life. Yes. And, and there is that. something beautiful about that, right? Like totally. you used to be a baby. And I, yeah. So 
I think about that with my little brother, right? Like he's married and buying a house and he has a kid on the way. And I'm like, I held you in my arms when you were a newborn and look at you. But yes, because he's almost 20 years older than she is. It's weird. Yeah. I mean, and my grandpa was 20 years older than my step grandma. It's when you're both adults, like it's different than he was an adult holding her as a baby. Exactly. That no, 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 totally. Yeah. Yeah. I have my husband is 12 years older than I am. I have yeah. no problem with big age differences. It's the combination of the two. I think that's completely correct. <laughs> it's the I changed your diapers. Yes. And and it's her response too. It's yeah. do you do you like me as well now as you did then? Ah, like no. But he loved you in a different way back then, or it would be weird. <laughs> I will say it is my favorite thing to do to my husband, though, when he'll be like, oh, my God, I was 15 when I saw that. And I'll be like, I was three. (laughs) (laughs) I do love it. I love it. Yes. Yes. I am very supportive of age differences in relationships where there's no A, no power and balance and B, none of this like, oh, I'm your father. (laughs) Right. No. And and we were 32 and 44. It was we were both consenting adults. Yes. Very much. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, But it's just like very much one of those like, I think you're right. It's the combo that just like, it's so intense. And Andrew Davies is just like, this is it. Austin was fucking weird. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's, it's true. It's also like the age difference is so apparent in appearances. Yes. They just look like daddy daughter. Yeah. And so to me, like, it can't be sexy when you're saying I held you. I I mean, it's never going to be sexy to say I held you as a baby. But I don't think it's meant to be sexy. I think it's meant to be like loving. It's beautiful. I've known you your whole life. Like yeah. this is a different kind of love than other kinds of love. Right. It's also been juxtaposed with Jane and Frank who had the short engagement and barely mm. knew each other. Right. It's like the opposite. Anyway. Yeah. OK. I'll stop because I'm no, very excited no, no. to make one more point later. So I have to say my words. So Emma realizes she has to tell Harriet and she goes running to find her and Harriet's running to find Emma and they both think the other is going to be angry at them, which is very beautiful because Harriet goes first and she has accepted Robert Martin's proposal. Yay! And Emma's like, this is the best news ever because now I don't have to break your heart. (laughs) Then we cut to Mr. Woodhouse, of course, being devastated. But Emma's like, well, listen, don't you want Mr. Knightley to keep the chicken thieves away? (laughs) Back with the chicken thieves. By the chicken thieves, I mean Frank Churchill. Yes, true. And she does have a moment where she she's like, um, well, he'll we'll live here with you as long as as long as you wish it. Not wanting to be like until you die, because that's like so morbid. Until you die. And then we're going to Donwell Abbey. Yeah. Um, and then we see Knightley like saying goodbye to the Abbey and seeing all of the people working in his fields and uh, or in the field, their fields, the fields of his tenants. Right. And then we get a Maybe the wedding or maybe a harvest party. I think it's a harvest and a rents party. I mm. think this is when everybody pays the rent. And oh. I I love this scene. This is an addition. First of all, one of the reasons this is, this is my final, you know, thing that I feel like I have to say. So Emma, one of the reasons I love Emma so much is that you get kind of an epilogue. You get an after the happily ever after. And you you see Emma and Knightley together and what a great couple they are. And it's yeah. adorable. I, I love, love watching them together. Yeah. And so you kind of get to see that here. It doesn't end just with them getting engaged and announcing it to Mr. Woodhouse. Yeah. And it's this like very cross-class moment, right? You literally watch Emma cross a room in order to talk to Harriet. And this thing that Emma said at the beginning, which is like, I could never visit you if you were Mrs. Martin, right? Like she is showing growth. She's like, that's not true. I will. I will literally come visit you in this room. Yeah. And she says, you guys should come over to Hartfield. Right. Exactly. And so I love that it's like establishing Knightley as a good, as a good landowner and that, um, and this cross class thing with Emma. And then it has this very classical ending of the three couples together, which is just very Shakespearean and oh, Greek. Yeah. The more couples, the better. Yeah. Right. And the fact that it ends with these three couples dancing, it's like, no, this isn't just a happy ending. It's a happy, happy, happy ending. Yes. And I love it. Agreed. Yes. It's so lovely. And we get a dog in the last scene as well. I thank God. Uh, not enough dogs in this one. There's a speech happening and the dog is just playing with a stick in the middle of the room. I was like, oh, I'm happy now. That's how I live my life. You also see Emma be nice to a dog in this movie, which you're yeah. like, oh, okay, I guess she's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, then we do end with uh, another chicken thieves moment. So weird. So weird. But bookending it, I guess. 
Yeah, I can't make this about Frank Churchill. The the other thing that I like about the ending is that it makes clear that Jane is really in love with Frank. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And we get Frank. He comes over and tries to like talk to Emma and be like, are we friends again? And she's like, whatever, dude. Like, yeah, fine. She's so over it that it's like, yeah, it's she's like, you're a fucking liar, but I'm happy. She's like, if, if she forgives you, then then I forgive you. But like, go be with her now. Um, And he's just so smitten that he doesn't even he's, he doesn't notice that she's over him. Yeah. And we, of course, get one more. You and I are not so much brother and sister as to make it improper. Brother and sister. No, indeed. Which is funny in this context. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, father, daughter. Yeah. OK. What do we make of the chickens at the end? Um, I think it's purely just it's just a framing device. I don't think that he thought too hard about it, to be honest. What a strange framing device. It's, I think maybe like the most generous way I can think about it is that it's a sort of a comic, like Andrew Davies thought the chicken thieves were really funny, Mm -hmm. but it's like a very jarring note to end on because the entire vibe of the movie is not generally pretty light and frothy and fun and like Jane Austen. Yeah. It's it, weird because it's very intense and strange and the you feel for the chickens and it's like almost like scary. Like it's the chickens I seem don't... really upset about it. Yeah, yeah of course they're I being upset. kidnapped. Yeah. They look sad like those poor chickens. Like it. I, I don't have answers for what this chi- framing chicken device is. I think it is a jarring note to start the film on, a jarring note to end the film on. And honestly, them dancing at the end of that um renter's party is like honestly like all I needed for the ending I know all of them holding hands and like these three different classes and three different courtships and three different Mm -hmm. marriages exactly so should we rapid fire Becca's study questions we shall that that puts a pin on Kate Beckinsale starring in Emma of the 1996 the second 1996 Emma so we're just going to do some rapid rapid fire questions first one is funniest line delivery it just has to be Mrs. Elton sticking out her tongue. Yeah. <laughs> she's perfect. Out her that tongue. like couldn't have been scripted. That was an acting choice and I loved it. Yeah, it's so good. Uh, to bounce off the Mrs. Elton stuff, I'm I'm going with I fancy myself a kind of shepherdess, you know. Oh, are you fond of sheep then, Mrs. Elton? <laughs> yeah. So good. Um, I'm going to give it actually to Mr. Elton in the carriage scene, which is a plot twist, but the way he says, Allow me to interpret this interesting silence. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> So then we're going to do notable uh, adaptations from the book. I Definitely the portrait coming to life and kissing Emma's hand. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. I think that honestly, I mean, this might be what uh, wins for me as well. But I think the Frank and Jane plot line being so present is a is a notable difference for sure. Yeah. And the chickens. (laughs) And the chickens. I think uh, pulling out of Emma's perspective and highlighting the servants and others for better or for worse is a very notable change from the book, which is in its own right, a stream of conscious, borderline stream of consciousness novel from Emma's perspective. Yeah. Worst part of the movie. All of the, I, <laughs> I feel like I just keep complaining about this, but like when you like can see Jane getting um, you know, saved by Mr. Dixon. I mean, really, the worst part is what about Henry? The like totally <laughs> unexplained. What about Henry? Yeah, for me, it's gonna be the the constant reminders of Knightley <laughs> holding Emma as a baby and changing her diapers and being her father figure. <laughs> um, I will round out the Holy Trinity and call it a tie between so I guess the quadrinity I don't know what that is but call it a tie between um Knightley's styling in the film and also uh the lack of Harriet Smith just like the like absence of the female friendships from the film Mm -hmm. absolutely Um, best thing about the film Kate Beckinsale's teeth her teeth are really great why did she quote-unquote fix them they look great they're adorable she's so cute in this movie she is really cute um I think you know, as weird as this is to say, because I've spent the entire time bashing on it, but Mrs. Elton and her accent is so good. So good. We don't understand it, but that doesn't mean we can't appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give it to the performance of Frank Churchill in this. I think he brings a different energy to Frank than I have seen on screen in a way that made him incredibly entertaining to watch. Totally. 
who wins this movie? I mean, Jane Fairfax. She doesn't have to be complicit in the murder, but she gets everything she wanted. <laughs> Jane Fairfax is the ultimate winner, and I actually do think it's fair to give it to this actress playing Jane Fairfax for so like, a truly yeah. excellent performance. All right, listeners, this concludes this coverage of Kate Beckinsale in Emma. The Andrew Davies version came out in 1996. I'll find a more clean way to refer to it some other time in my life. But for next time, we're actually going to be covering Emma Approved. Very exciting, very fun for those who love the Lizzie Bennet Diaries. Uh, A lot of overlapping creators there. But in the meantime, Vanessa, thank you so much for joining us. Do you want to tell the people where they can find you? Yes, I recommend that you follow our pilgrimage account, Uh, which is Common Ground Pilgrimages, because we do one Austin pilgrimage a year. This year we're doing Northanger Abbey in Bath and Persuasion in Lyme Regis. And so if you want to come with us and travel and talk about Austin, that is where to follow us. That's amazing. And people should also go listen to your new season of Hot and Bothered. Yes, they should go listen. Thank you. You guys are so sweet. Go (laughs) listen to our new season of Hot and Bothered. We will no doubt be talking about an Austin adaptation sooner rather than later. Amazing. Fantastic. All right. Well, then until next time, stay proper. And don't be complicit in the murder of your aunt. Don't do it. Or of of your boyfriend's aunt, I guess. Don't do it. (laughs) You heard it here first, then. Hot and Precious is edited by Molly Burdick and audio produced by Graham Cook. Our show art is designed by Torrance Brown. Our show is transcribed by SpeechDoc Podcast Transcription. For transcripts and to learn more about our team, check out our website at podandprejudice.com. To keep up with the show, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pod and Prejudice. If you love what you hear, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash podandprejudice to see how you can support us or just drop us a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.